ahead and get started. We don't have a piano player tonight, so we won't sing or anything. I was going to go ahead and tell everybody to be praying for Brother Bill and their family with uh, uh, their granddaughter, Devin. Had to go back to the hospital. Doors still not doing good and Bill's not doing good. Keep praying for them and also pray for Russell. Uh, he had surgery and He's really struggling with the issues he has from a stroke and stuff like that. So just be praying for him. Anybody else before we get into it? Let your request be made known unto God. All right, Ephesians chapter 1 tonight. Get right into the lesson here. This will be our fourth Wednesday on this series on the mysteries of God. Amen. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, 1, Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and, of, and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required that a, man must, uh, that a steward must be found faithful. And so in order to be a, a, a minister and a steward of God, you have to know the mysteries and you have to be faithful to those mysteries. Uh, any church that is not faithfully teaching these things is not a church that is in the will of God. Let's just be honest about it. No matter if it's a Baptist, Catholic, Methodist, Presbyterian, whatever. We are to be stewards of these mysteries. And tonight, we're going to begin to look at this one, this mystery here that Paul talks about in Ephesians 1, 9, where he says that God, having made known due to this redemption and him abounding toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of what? His will. His will. Now, religion talks a lot about the will of God. They talk a lot about it. I heard a Baptist preacher one time. Uh... He was down there in that North Carolina crowd, but he stood up and he said, said, people ask me all the time, how do I find the will of God? He said, just get busy and you'll, you'll find it. <laughs> and what was funny about that is that church was like, amen, preacher. Yep, of course. That's good, preacher. Just get out there and get busy. Don't, don't read your Bible. Paul said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, perfect, acceptable will of God. The will of God is something you prove. And you've got to have a mind to do so. Amen. And so the way you find the will of God is through the renewing of your mind by the Spirit of God that you yourself can prove the will of God. Amen? And it's not something that God has not... What, look, what has He made known? If he's made it known and you don't know it, then whose fault is that? Yours. Don't, don't blame it on God ain't revealed it to me. Yeah, he has. You've just been taught to think it's out there somewhere other than where it's not. Or out there, out there outside of the word of God is where you're looking for it. God has made it known. Amen? And so we're going to begin looking at this mystery of his will because it's here, beginning right here in Ephesians chapter 1, the Spirit of God now begins to reveal to the church of this present time the purpose of the mystery. You've been taught some things about the mystery in Romans through Galatians. You've been taught some things about it. You were told there was a preaching of Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. You're getting ready to get knee deep in it. Getting ready to get up the eyeballs in the, the preaching of Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Here the Spirit of God now begins to teach us the purpose of this mystery and our calling in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. A lot of people don't even know why they're in Christ. Gentiles don't know why they're in Christ. They think they're replacements for Israel and everything else. It's here where the Spirit of God begins to teach us these things. And so remember the first two mysteries that we looked at. Right? We've already looked at these two. Romans eleven twenty five. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning this mystery, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. The first mystery we saw involves Israel in part and the fullness of the Gentiles. Amen? Amen. That means for the last 2,000 years, 
God has been taking part of Israel and he's been calling out of the Gentiles a fullness to put with this part of Israel, but Paul don't tell you why yet. He just tells you that's what God is doing. What the mystery of Romans 11 is, it involves the salvation of Israelites and Gentiles that believe the gospel. That's what it's about. And God is now saving Israelites and Gentiles from among all nations. And this has been going on now for close to 2,000 years. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. And this period of time that you now live in, in which God is doing what Paul reveals in Romans eleven twenty five, 25, this period that you now live in was never prophesied. It was hid from ages and from generations and now is made manifest. God never revealed that he was going to do what Paul said he's now doing in Romans eleven twenty five. 25. He kept a secret. Second mystery we looked at is 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Paul there reveals an event involving the Jews and Gentiles saved at this present time. He says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and, and, and we shall be changed. That's an event involving those saved during this present time. So God has sent salvation to Jews and Gentiles alike. All who believe the gospel are baptized by one spirit into one body and there's an event out here in the future in which the Lord is going to descend from heaven and gather unto himself all the Jews and Gentiles that have believed the gospel for the last 2,000 years. Wow. Paul still ain't told you why. Yeah. Amen? Why would he? Why, is, why, why would any believer need to know why God is creating this church when they've neglected these first two mysteries. That's right. Amen. Amen. You still going around saying, no, it started in Acts 2. You're going around saying the rapture's mid-trib, post-trib. Well, you ain't ready for Ephesians. Sorry. You haven't even acknowledged these two mysteries that God has revealed. And now, now, so what we have here in the first two mysteries is this period of time right here. God at this present time, Romans eleven twenty five. 25, we know that mystery, that blindness is happened. It's already happened to Israel for a period of time until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so right here we have the beginning and the end of our, of our dispensation. What is the mystery? The salvation of Jews and Gentiles during this present time and their rapture to meet the Lord in the air and to be taken into the heavenly places. Amen. Now, when we come to the book of Ephesians, y'all understand that. That's the mystery right there. That's the, that's the end of it. The mystery right here. Nobody else is getting into this mystery after this event right here. Now they can still play a part in God's eternal purpose. They're just not going to play a part in this aspect of it. Amen? And so when you come, so now we come to the book of Ephesians. Now Paul is getting ready to begin to educate us on why God is doing this. Amen? Amen. Ephesians 1 9. First off, let's look at what the passage actually says. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Now to get the next word. According. Accord. Right, we talk about be of one accord. We talk about discord. Right? So what Paul's actually saying here is he's linking what God has made known to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. The, Paul's not saying the mystery that God purposed in himself. He's talking about the mystery that God has made known according 
to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. The mystery is not the entire purpose of God. It's just part of it. Because verse 10 he says that in the dispensation. Notice this is an explanation. You see that? Verse 10 is explaining verse 9. But verse 10 is not the mystery of his will. Verse 10 is the good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. Yep. The mystery is a part of this, but only a part. There's more in verse 10 than just the mystery. Amen. Amen. So what Paul is saying here is that God has now made known the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. So he's making known the mystery of this eternal purpose right here revealed in verse 10. Well, what is the purpose? What has God, what has God purposed in himself? It, I mean, listen guys, read this. According to whose good pleasure, which who hath purposed where? You don't care what that verse says? Amen. It's pretty important. I tell you what, you better not brush over that, get your three chapters in so you can go watch YouTube. You better take a passage like that into your belly and regurgitate it like a cow does its cud, and re-chew that thing, and swallow it again, and bring it back up, chew on it some more, and keep chewing on it, till you start to comprehend it. It's good preacher. Amen. Amen. This is what God has purposed in himself. What did God create in the beginning? Well, there it is. When did God create the heaven and the earth? Well, there's the fullness of times. You want to understand the mystery of this book? You want to understand the mystery of why God stepped out in Genesis 1-1 and created something? Paul tells you in Colossians that it was created by Christ and for Christ. Look at what he says here. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather what? In what? That means there's more than one. What's he gathering together in one? All things in who? Well, then that means there's multiple things in Christ. You're not the only one. And so when we say the body of Christ didn't start in Acts 2, they'll say, well, Paul said there was people in Christ before him. No kidding. What's God gathering together in one? All things in what? Both. How many is there? One or two? And these two are going to be gathered together in what? Which are where? That means there's a gathering of things in Christ in heaven and a gathering of things in Christ on earth. Amen. And in the fullness of times, God is going to gather together both of these into one. And you are the mystery of that purpose that he's now made known. You are a part of this eternal purpose right here but just a part of it. The mystery of his will. Look at what he says in Ephesians 3.11. How many purposes have God, has God purposed in Christ? How many y'all see there? According to what? So there's, not, there's, there's one purpose. Look over to Ephesians 3. I want you to see the structure of this. Because it ties in with what we're talking about. Look at Ephesians 3, 8. Notice the semicolon at the end of verse 8. So verse 8 and verse 9 is Paul explaining the twofold purpose of his ministry, which he just mentioned back in verse 7. 
Back in verse 7, Paul said, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul is preaching to the Gentiles something that is unsearchable. That the Gentiles were chosen before the foundation of the world to inherit. How did the book begin? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. The Gentiles, Paul's now preaching something about Christ that was unsearchable, that the Gentiles have been made fellow heirs of. Amen. Not only that, semicolon, second part of the ministry, is to make all men see what is the fellowship of what? Which hath been hid where? Who created what? Y'all understand this now? That when God created all things, there was a mystery hid in him when he created all things. And so Paul's, you know what Paul's telling you there? He said, if you truly comprehend what I'm telling you, then you're going to understand the fellowship of this mystery to the eternal purpose of God. Because look at what he says now. To the intent. If you notice, there's a colon at the end of verse 9. So seeing the fellowship of the mystery, the explanation of that is to the intent that now one of the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to what? The manifold wisdom of God. Do you understand what manifold wisdom is? I hope you do. Means God ain't doing today what He was doing thirty five hundred years ago, and after our rapture, He's not going to be doing in the tribulation and the millennial kingdom what He's been doing for the last two thousand years. But through time, God's wisdom has been working manifold, but it's all working toward the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And you are a hidden part of that purpose that he planned, purposed before the world began, and kept hid in himself. Yeah. Amen, preacher. Amen. Amen. And so when Paul says here, that God has made known the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. Verse 10 is that eternal purpose that he's purposed in Christ. What is it? The gathering of all things in heaven in Christ, the gathering of all things in earth, on earth in Christ, and then the gathering of both of those things together in one. That's his eternal purpose. Amen? What a thing. Hey, Brother Adrian. And so, and so verse 10, as I've already said, verse 10, this is not the mystery right here. That's the eternal purpose of God. Your mystery is in here, but you're, there's, there's more in that eternal purpose than the mystery. Amen? And so... Hope you understand that. All Paul is saying here is that God has made known the mystery of his will in accordance to this eternal purpose. And so now we have everything. We, we understand. We should have complete and total knowledge of the eternal purpose of God in time. What God is doing from the beginning to the end. And you, when you understand this mystery, you ought to understand your specific purpose and calling in that eternal purpose. Amen. Amen? You know what's going to happen if you don't? You're going to keep walking according to the course of this world, not according to his good pleasure, which he's purposed in himself. 
Paul uses the word according 10 times in the first three chapters of Ephesians. You do well to go read them. And the only time it's used negative is when he says you in time past walked according to the course of this world. But now after you're educated on this, he says you quit walking as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Because we, we understand the eternal purpose of the creator. We understand the mystery of his will. What he's doing at this present time. We just talked about it. He's saving Jews and Gentiles. And one of these days, the Lord's going to descend and call them people out of this world. Now we're going to be taught why. You were called into Christ to fulfill something God chose to do before the foundation of this world you live in. This is what Ephesians is getting ready to educate you on. And Paul's great prayer is that you would come out of this comprehending three things. Hope, riches, and power. Amen? Amen. So we're, we're, this is where we're going to go in this. And so God has now made known. We've looked at this chart before. Right out here is, this is the beauty, guys. We, we come into this world, we have, such a, we have such a pathetic perspective of time. And you always will until you read the Bible. If you never read the Bible, your, your perspective of time is going to be limited to SEC football, about seven presidential elections, and a couple of wars, and whatever else. You know, maybe a couple grandkids and whatever. They'll put you to bed with a shovel and that'll be it. We come into this world, we have such a pathetic perspective of time. But we understand it and, and we sit and we think, oh, it's the end. It's the end. It's the end. It's the last days, last days, last days. I'm getting old. I'm getting old. I'm getting old. Guys... We don't even enter into the beginning of God's eternal purpose until Revelation 21. We get there and we read that as the end of the Bible and it's just the beginning of God's eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. Amen. Paul tells you in Ephesians that you were put into Christ for the ages to come. Listen at that again. Ages to come. He says in Ephesians 3.20, unto him be glory by the church or, or in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all what? World without what? There it is. And so when we look at something like this, here's what I want you to comprehend. God, before the world began, purposed this eternal purpose in the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is how God is working all things together toward that eternal purpose. This wisdom of God was ordained before the world and has been worked out by God through the fullness of times, plural. That's what we call his manifold wisdom. Understand that the wisdom of God had only purposed one eternal purpose. But the way that God is working it out is his wisdom is operating in a manifold manner through different times throughout this period of time. And when it's all said and done, everything is working together towards this. But now, so if we look at it, let's pretend this arrow here is the revelation of our mystery. So what has God now made known? God has now made known the mystery according to this eternal purpose to the intent that the principalities and powers in heavenly places might know by the church the manifold wisdom of God. There's nothing left to know. We know exactly how God is going to bring about this eternal purpose. Yes, sir. Sure do. And it's not all about you. And it ain't all about the body of Christ. It's about Israel, the nations, the angels. We're talking about all things in heaven, all things on earth. It's about the lion and the lamb and the ox and the trees and the birds. And 
Anything else you can fathom. Amen? This is God's eternal purpose, and we now understand the entire eternal purpose of God. And you know your part in it. You should. You should understand why God is saving Jews and Gentiles at this present time. Why he's going to rapture them out according to the mystery that Paul revealed. And so the, we're talking about the mystery of his will in accordance. So you're being saved today as a part of this eternal purpose, but you're a part of that eternal purpose that God had kept hid. I hope that makes sense to you. I hope you understand it. Amen. And so right here, the mystery. What is it? Jew and Gentile, both saved by the gospel, all of them caught up here at the rapture. And what God is doing at this present time, all these people saved at this present time that are going to be raptured out of here one day is a part of the mystery of God's will in accordance to his eternal purpose that he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You getting that? Yes, sir. Listen, man. I don't often toot my own horn. But this is a blessed church here. It's a blessed church. You ain't running around with a false identity. Thinking that you're something that you're not. You're being educated into why God saved you and why you're going to be raptured out of here one day because you were put in Christ to fulfill a purpose, as Paul said, who had saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but now is made manifest. Yeah. Amen. I thank God for it, man. And so you should understand what your purpose is because it's about two realms, right? Where are you being gathered to? The land of Israel or to the clouds? Why? Because Paul at the beginning of this chapter said that God blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So obviously your part in this eternal purpose has something to do with heaven. Amen. Not earth. Should we understand it? Now, look at Ephesians chapter 1. I want to point out some things here. I want to show you everything that God is doing at this present time in accordance to this eternal purpose. Look at Ephesians 1.15. See that word wherefore? Paul shifts focus in verse 15. And what he's now praying from verse 15 onward is in light of the first 14 verses. Right? I always say, I always say, when Paul uses the word therefore, it's based upon what he had just said, but it's a conclusion. When he says wherefore, it's based upon what he just said, but it's not a conclusion. He said, we're going to go somewhere else with this now. He laid out the doctrine there in the first four, and he says, wherefore, in light of these things, my prayer is that you would be able to understand it. Amen. And the point I'm making is this though. That means the first section of Ephesians prior to that prayer is the first 14 verses and the middle verse is verse 7. The last verse, they both mention redemption. Verse 7 and verse 14. What do you do with a book like that? In whom we have redemption through what? And then there's coming a day of the redemption of the purchased possession. That, this day right here. Christ paid with blood 
a people that is being purchased at this present time. And there's coming a day in which he's going to redeem that purchased possession. Amen. Paul wants you to understand why. Amen? Because that's the middle verse. In whom we have redemption through his blood. You know what that means? That passage and the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ stands as the heart and middle verse of the revelation of this mystery. Amen. When Christ died on the cross, we all the Old Testament told you he was going to die. That was not a mystery. But what he was dying, part of what he was dying for was a mystery. Amen. Amen. Let me give you, let me show it to you like this. There's Ephesians in a nutshell. That, that happened in time. 2,000 years ago, a man showed up on this earth and went to a cross and died. There ain't no denying it. And if they could have found his body, they would have already. They, 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 they would love nothing more. They would have loved nothing more than to brought, brought that man out in the streets and said, everybody preaching this resurrection nonsense, there he is. But a man went to a cross and he died on that cross. The verses before Ephesians 1, 7 are about what God chose to do before the foundation of the world. It's what God, what God purposed back here, he kept hid. When Christ died on that cross, part of the reason he died on the cross was because of this back here. He ain't just dying for Israel. God had already chose Jew and Gentile and his son before the world even began. Yep. Amen, preacher. Everything that we now have in the heavenly places in Christ was according to God choosing us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Amen. When Christ died on the cross, you know why he died on the cross? Because God predestinated Jew and Gentile to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. To the praise of what? The glory of his grace. So when Christ died on that cross, guess what was it? It was according to the riches of his grace. Nothing you ever did brought this forth. Christ dying on that cross was because God, before any of us ever got here, already chose Jew and Gentile in Christ and predestinated them to adoption. And then he kept it secret. This is what Paul means when he says, this is what he means. Look, look at these verses. According as he chose us in him when? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto what? According to the good pleasure of his what? That has nothing to do with Israel. That has nothing to do with the nation of Israel. This is a, this is a, a, a special election and predestination in Christ that God determined he was going to do before the world began and then kept it hid. And when Christ showed up and died on the cross, he was redeeming, he was shedding blood to redeem a people for this purpose, not the purpose God had already revealed in the Old Testament. And it's that, it's that thing right there that Christ is dying for that none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Amen. It's that. Amen? Amen. Y'all understanding this? Amen. And so when you look at Ephesians, the first chapter, Ephesians 1, 7 is the middle passage. Before that verse, you have what God purposed in himself before the world began, and after that verse, you have Paul telling you he's made it known. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And in verse 10, so you go from before the foundation of the world, dispensation of the fullness of times. In seven verses, 
You getting it? When were we chosen in Christ? What did God keep hid? The mystery. What has God made known? The mystery of His will according to what? According to this eternal purpose in Christ, right? And so when God chose you in Christ back here, He chose you in Christ for this eternal purpose here. He kept it hid, now He's made it known. And it's not okay. You can sit around and be like, it's not okay. For people purchased with blood to be ignorant as to why they were purchased with blood. Amen, Amen brother. I love what Dr. Ruckman said one time. As, as he was talking about, he was, I love this story, man. He was stopped at a gas station one night, and there was a bunch of these hippie Christians out and about. And this girl walked up to him and she said, uh, she said, you a Christian? He said, yeah. And he told her when he got saved. She said, have you ever spoken tongues? And Ruckman just started dancing there and acting like he was speaking in tongues. And he said, that girl stepped back and started clapping. Oh, he's got it. He's got it. Ruck, Ruckman said, Ruckman said, it's a, he said, it's a dishonor to God for a Christian to be that stupid. Amen. Think about what I just said. Stupidity is unbecoming of a saint of God. I would not have you ignorant. I would not have you ignorant. Ignorance and stupidity of the word of God is unbecoming of people chosen in Christ before the world began, predestinated to the adoption of children, purchased with blood, sealed with the Holy Spirit of God, awaiting the redemption of the purchased possession. Amen. It is unbecoming. People get mad at me. They'll get mad at me for that. Prove me wrong. Show me anywhere in the Bible where it says it's okay to be ignorant. Amen, preacher. Now I know why people, why people, listen, it's not easy guys. This is 20 years of Bible study. I don't expect you to go home, pick it up today and understand it. But I tell you what, if you read it and you don't understand it, it ought to bother you. It ought to be your goal to know it, to understand it. It was Paul's prayer. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may, you see this, this information right here? When Paul says that you may know the hope of his calling, how are you going to know the hope of the calling? You don't even understand the information. The riches of the glory of his inheritance where? In the saints. The exceeding greatness of his power when he wrought, when he, which he wrought Christ. When he, how are you going to understand the hope, the riches, and the power and you don't even understand this information? People walking around with a false hope. It's important, man. Y'all understand how Ephesians 1, 7, that redemption of the cross stands as the heart of the mystery. That when Christ died, it was because there was something God had already purposed in himself that he had been keeping hid from ages and from generations that he's now made manifest. Christ died right here on this cross because all these people saved at this present time were chosen in Christ before the world began. Amen. We're not talking about Calvinism. God chose every man that would believe on his son Amen. to this election. That's right. The only way you get out of that purpose is don't believe. All of us, God predestinated us to adoption. That means, that means the moment I believed the gospel, my destiny had already been set by God before the world began. And this is going to get into what Paul means in verse 11 when he says, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated. According to what? 
the purpose of him that worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. What I'm being saved for now and my inheritance that I've obtained in Christ is in accordance to this purpose right here that God is working all things together for. What a blessing, man. And so what is God doing at this present time in accordance to his will? Well, he's saving Jews and Gentiles, going to call them up to the heavenly places because these people today are a part of the eternal purpose of God that he had kept secret since the world began. And so let's, let's look at some things here. I'm almost done. This stuff can get overwhelming, man. I don't want y'all's brains to overload. Step number one, chosen and predestinated before the world began and then kept secret. Step number two, Jesus Christ died on a cross and shed blood because of this purpose right here. You know why he died on the cross? Because God chose you and predestinated you before the world began. Now people's like, well, I just don't know if I... Be. See, people hear words like that, dude, and you can't even use biblical words anymore because people's like, they hear, they hear predestination. People will say, oh, Paul's a Calvinist because they heard me use the word predestination. Yep. Well, what was the apostle Paul a Calvinist? He used it. John Calvin, John Calvin was a lunatic. But I'm telling you right now, if Jesus Christ died before you were born, it means nothing you did caused it. <laughs> then why did he die? Obviously because Sometime before that, God had already chosen and predestinated something. That's Paul's whole point in Romans 9. Jacob and Esau, both in the womb. The elder shall serve the younger. Based upon what? Neither child had done any good or evil. So that election wasn't based on works. What was it based on? God, the purpose of God according to what? That the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of him that what? Calleth. There's the election. There's the call. You want in it? God already did. Listen, listen. This is what God did. Chose and predestinated us, kept it secret. Christ came to the cross, paid with his blood the price for the purchase of this people, and then God raised him from the dead and exalted him into the right, unto his own right hand, and gave him all those riches of glory that Paul wants us to comprehend. God never said he blessed you with all spiritual blessings. He said he blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places where? Christ is the heir. He's already exalted. He's already been given all things by God the Father. And before the foundation of the world, God chose us and predestinated us in Christ unto adoption to participate in this inheritance with him. And then you know what he did? So these things happen in time. Right? That happened before the foundation of the world. Now all this happened in time. Christ died on a cross, was raised from the dead and exalted to the right hand of the Father. Then you know what happened? The gospel was preached. Amen? Why is that gospel being preached? For the calling of this election. Do you know what happened in time? You people here tonight, at some point in time, heard that gospel. Paul says in Ephesians 1.13, two afters there. In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth. 
the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed. So at some point in time, you heard the gospel, and after hearing it, you believed. And after you believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Sealed? What does that mean, sealed? What are you? That means... God, you say, what is my seal though? Guys, quit thinking of the seal of God as like this, this little ghost that comes upon you and makes you feel something. Yeah. The seal. After you believe, the seal of God is the Holy Spirit of promise. Amen. Right there. What did Paul say? In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. You go around saying, you, you start thinking that the sealing of the Holy Spirit is this feeling inside of you. Why not just believe what God said? Amen. Amen. Yep. Notice what he says there. Is the word holy capitalized? then it ain't a noun. It ain't a, it ain't a proper person. It's not a person. Holy is an adjective in that passage. You say, well, what is, what, what is, what, if something's holy, what is it? Set apart, sanctified, separate. What seals us is that Holy Spirit of what? He tells you what the Spirit is. Of promise. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of God's promise until, which is the earnest of our what? Until the redemption of what? Do you understand what God's doing in time? Do you know why Jews and Gentiles are being saved? This gospel has been sent to Jew and Gentile and all who believe. All who believe are sealed as a purchased possession of the Lord Jesus Christ, awaiting this redemption of the purchased possession where we go up to participate in these riches that God has given His Son in the heavenly places. So you people right now, as you sit here, as you sit here right now, God the Father the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, what has He done? With what? In where? Christ already attained them. There's nothing for you to do. Whose are they? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Christ already rose from the dead. He's already exalted and seated at the right hand of God. God has already put all things under his feet. God has, he didn't say, who will bless us, who hath blessed us, where? In Christ. When Paul says he wants you to comprehend the riches of the glory of his inheritance. Not yours, his. That's his inheritance up there, guys. Not yours. God gave it to Jesus Christ. And so, when we get sealed in Christ... We are put there and in Him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Being what? What were we predestinated to? Adoption. We've obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. That takes you all the way back to this right here. 
The inheritance you have obtained is according to this purpose of God right here. Meaning you're going to play a part in it. You're going to play a part in the gathering of all things together in heaven and earth into the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Now you start, listen, you start getting enlightened to this stuff. Paul's second prayer in Ephesians 3 is that God would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Now what does he mean by that? Paul's talking about that, the riches of that glory, strengthening your inner man that Christ may dwell where? Christ can't dwell in your heart until the eyes of your understanding are enlightened. And when you, when you get that knowledge in you and you receive that spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding are enlightened and you know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory and the exceeding greatness of his power. The riches of that glory through the enlightened understanding will strengthen your inner man. And Christ will indwell the heart. And then you'll start saying, I want to walk according to this purpose. I want to walk worthy of this vocation and calling that I have in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to walk according to the course of this world any longer. Walking here. Amen. So Christ died, was buried, rose again. Exalted to the right hand of God, where God blessed him, God put all things under his feet, and then he sent this gospel out to Jews and Gentiles, amen, sent this gospel to Jews and Gentiles so that they could receive this inheritance that God predestinated us for in Jesus Christ as his children. Amen. And when you go up here, you're going up here to meet the Lord in the air. Why are we going up? To be the body of Christ in the heavenly places. To be his fullness that filleth all in all. That's why we're going up there. You're not going to get the whole thing. All these people running around. You, you, you know how people think when they say, God's blessed me with all spiritual blessings. Did he? Think a little highly of yourself, don't you? He blessed Christ. You get a measure. They're his. Christ gives them to whomsoever he will. And you're going to appear before a judgment seat of Christ to receive what you've done in his body and he'll give you the reward of the inheritance based on how he sees fit to give it to you. Because he's the head. Amen? And when we go up there, we're going up there Every one of us is going to receive a portion of that inheritance and every one of us is going to make up a measure of the fullness of Christ. But it's for a purpose. It's for a purpose. And this is where next week we're going to get into that mystery of God's will. Now Paul's beginning to teach you. This leads into the mystery of Christ. This mystery of God's will leads into the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Christ is the creation of a new creature in the heavenly realm called the church, which is his body. And then this is going to lead to the great mystery of Ephesians 5, where every member of that body, through knowing the love of Christ, passeth knowledge. The way the church and the head, the way the, the body and the head become one, it's through the love of the head and the submission of the body. Amen. That's the great mystery. And these three, these three mysteries here, the mystery of his will, the mystery of Christ, and the great mystery of Christ and the church. And then we got one more after that, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then Paul sums everything up in the mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness. What a thing. Amen. What a thing. Amen. Amen. Both the mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness are at work right now. There's a spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, but you are to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's where godliness comes from. Being renewed in the spirit of your mind and walking according to that eternal purpose which God gave us in Christ before the world began, not according to the course of this world. Amen.
And so the two great mysteries is Christ and the church and the mystery of godliness, man. I, that's, guys, I've been seeing this stuff darkly through a glass for years and years. I was talking to Brother Michael Lloyd last night, and we, were, we get all excited about this, man. We get, we get like, we get giddy like little high school girls, you know. Me and Brother Lloyd was talking. I called him after I was looking at this stuff, and I said, hop on Zoom with me real quick. He hopped on Zoom, and I was showing him these charts and stuff, and I said, I said, Brother Lloyd, I said, I've been seeing darkly through a glass. I said, and I just keep coming. All these things just come into greater, greater focus. That's the evidence of God's Spirit. Not goosebumps. And... <laughs> the evidence of God's Spirit is coming into a knowledge and an understanding of the eternal purpose that we've been baptized and sealed in Christ for. And I'm coming face to face with it more and more. And the more I understand that, the more I'm like Paul between this mystery, between this book of Ephesians and Colossians, when he gets out there and talks about Christ in you, the hope of glory, he tells you in Philippians, I don't want to know anything but Christ. That's going to take you to Colossians. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Any man that understands this calling has to have the mindset Paul did in Philippians. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Then in Colossians, you can start talking about Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. Any questions on this? All right. Adrian, would you close us in prayer, brother?